Section 51 of The Promulgation of Universal Peace, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nicholas James Bridgewater. The Promulgation of Universal Peace, Volume 1, by Abdul Baha Abbas. Section 51. Discourses of Abdul Baha delivered in New York, July 1st, 1912, at 309 West 78th Street, New York. Notes by Howard McNutt. What could be better before God than thinking of the poor? For the poor are beloved by our Heavenly Father. When His Holiness Christ came upon the earth, those who believed in him and followed him were the poor and lowly, showing the poor were near to God. When a rich man believes and follows the manifestation of God, it is a proof that his wealth is not an obstacle and does not prevent him from attaining the pathway of salvation. After he has been tested and tried, it will be seen whether his possessions are a hindrance in his religious life. But the poor are especially beloved of God. Their lives are full of difficulties, their trials continual, their hopes are in God alone. Therefore, you must assist the poor as much as possible, even by sacrifice of yourself. No deed of man is greater before God than helping the poor. Spiritual conditions are not dependent upon the possession of worldly treasures or the absence of them. When physically destitute, spiritual thoughts are more likely. Poverty is stimulus toward God. Each one of you must have great consideration for the poor and render them assistance organize in an effort to help them and prevent increase in poverty the greatest means for prevention is that whereby the laws of the community will be so framed and enacted that it will not be possible for a few to be millionaires and many destitute one of baha'u'llah's teachings is the adjustment of means of livelihood in human society under the adjustment there can be no extremes in human conditions as regards wealth and sustenance. For the community needs financier, farmer, merchant, and laborer, just as an army must be composed of commander, officers, and privates. All cannot be commanders. All cannot be officers or privates. Each in his station in the social fabric must be competent each in his function according to his ability, but justness of opportunity for all. Lycurgus, king of Sparta, who lived long before the day of Christ, conceived the idea of absolute equality in government. He proclaimed laws by which all the people of Sparta were classified into certain divisions. Each division had its separate rights and function. First, farmers and tillers of the soil. Second, artisans and merchants. Third, leaders or grandees. Under the laws of Lycurgus, the latter were not required to engage in any labor or vocation, but it was incumbent upon them to defend the country in case of war and invasion. Then he divided Sparta into 9,000 equal parts or provinces, appointing 9,000 leaders or grandees to protect them. In this way, the farmers of each province were assured of protection, but each farmer was compelled to pay a tax to support the grandee of that province. The farmers and merchants were not obliged to defend the country, in lieu of labor, the grandees received the taxes. Lycurgus, in order to establish this forever as a law, brought 9,000 grandees together, 
told them he was going upon a long journey and wished this form of government to remain effective until his return they swore an oath to protect and preserve his law he then left his kingdom went into voluntary exile and never came back no man ever made such a sacrifice to ensure equality among his fellow men a few years passed and the whole system of government he had founded collapsed although established upon such a just and wise basis difference of capacity in human individuals is fundamental it is impossible for all to be alike all to be equal all to be wise baha'u'llah has revealed principles and laws which will accomplish the adjustment of varying human capacities he has said that whatsoever is possible of accomplishment in human government will be effected through these principles when the laws he has instituted are carried out there will be no millionaires possible in the community and likewise no extremely poor this will be effected and regulated by adjusting the different degrees of human capacity the fundamental basis of the community is agriculture tillage of the soil all must be producers each person in the community whose income is equal to his individual producing capacity shall be exempt from taxation but if his income is greater than his needs he must pay a tax until an adjustment is effected that is to say a man's capacity for production and his needs will be equalized and reconciled through taxation if his production exceeds he will pay no tax if his necessities exceed his production he shall receive an amount sufficient to equalize or adjust therefore taxation will be proportionate to capacity and production and there will be no poor in the community baha'u'llah likewise commanded the rich to give freely to the poor in the kitab al aqdas it is further written by him that those who have a certain amount of income must give one-fifth of it to god the creator of heaven and earth two july first nineteen twelve at three o nine west seventy eighth street new york from stenographic notes i desire to make manifest among the friends in america a new light that they may become a new people that a new foundation may be established and complete harmony be realized for the foundation of baha'u'llah is love when you go to green acre you must have infinite love for each other each preferring the other before himself the people must be so attracted to you that they will exclaim what happiness exists among you and will see in your faces the lights of the kingdom then in wonderment they will turn to you and seek the cause of your happiness you must give the message through action and deed not alone by word word must be conjoined with deed you must love your friend better than yourself yes be willing to sacrifice yourself the cause of baha'u'llah has not yet appeared in this country i desire that you be ready to sacrifice everything for each other even life itself then i will know that the cause of baha'u'llah has been established i will pray for you that you may become the cause of upraising the lights of god may everyone point to you and ask why are these people so happy i want you to be happy in green acre to laugh smile and rejoice in order that others may be made happy by you i will pray for you three 
July 5th, 1912, at 309 West 78th Street, New York. Notes by Howard McNutt. Question. Quote, you have stated that we are living in a universal cycle, the first manifestation of which was Adam, and the universal manifestation of which is Baha'u'llah. Does this imply that other universal cycles preceded this one, and that all traces of them have been effaced? Cycles in which the ultimate purpose was the divine spiritualization of man, just as it is the creative intention in this one. End quote. The divine sovereignty is an ancient sovereignty, not an accidental sovereignty. If we imagine this world of existence has a beginning, we can say the divine sovereignty is accidental, that there was a time when it did not exist. A king without a kingdom is impossible. He cannot be without a country, without subjects, without an army, without dominion, or he would be without kingship. All these exigencies or requirements of sovereignty must exist for a king. When they do exist, we can apply the word sovereignty to him. Otherwise, his sovereignty is imperfect, incomplete. If none of these conditions exist, sovereignty does not exist. If we acknowledge there is a beginning for this world of creation, we acknowledge the sovereignty of God is accidental. That is, we admit a time when the reality of divinity has been without dominion, literally defeated. The names and attributes of divinity are requirements of this world. The names powerful, the living, the provider, the creator, require and necessitate the existence of creatures. If there were no creatures, creator would be meaningless. If there were none to provide for, we could not think of the provider. If there were no life, the living would be beyond the power of conception. Therefore, all the names and attributes of God require the existence of objects or creatures upon which they have been bestowed and in which they have become manifest. If there was a time when no creation existed, when there was none to provide for, it would imply a time when there was no existent one, no trainer, and the attributes and qualities of God would have been meaningless and without significance. Therefore, the requirements of the attributes of God do not admit of cessation or interruption, for the names of God are actually and forever existing and not potential. Because they convey life, they are called life-giving. Because they provide, they are called bountiful, the provider. Because they create, they are called creator. Because they educate and govern, the name Lord God is applied. That is to say, the divine names emanate from the eternal attributes of divinity. Therefore, it is proved that the divine names presuppose the existence of objects or beings. How then is a time conceivable when this sovereignty has not been existent? This divine sovereignty is not to be measured by 6,000 years. This interminable, illimitable universe is not the result of that measured period. This stupendous laboratory and workshop has not been limited to 6,000 revolutions of the earth about the sun in its production. With the slightest reflection, man can be assured that this calculation and announcement is childish, especially in view of the fact that it is scientifically proved the terrestrial globe has been the habitation of man long prior to such limited estimate. As to the record in the Bible concerning His Holiness Adam entering paradise, eating from the tree, and his expulsion through the temptation of Satan, these are all symbols beneath which there are wonderful and divine meanings, not to be calculated in years, dates, and measurement of time. Likewise, 
the statement that god created the heaven and the earth in six days is symbolic we will not explain this further today the texts of the holy books are all symbolical needing authoritative interpretation when man casts even a cursory glance of reflection upon the question of the universe he discovers it is very ancient a persian philosopher was looking up into the heavens lost in wonder he said quote, i have written a book containing seventy proofs of the accidental appearance of the universe but i still find it very ancient baha'u'llah says quote, the universe hath neither beginning nor ending End quote. he has set aside the elaborate theories and exhaustive opinions of scientists and material philosophers by the simple statement there is no beginning no ending the theologians and religionists advance plausible proofs that the creation of the universe dates back six thousand years the scientists bring forth indisputable facts and say no these evidences indicate ten twenty fifty thousand years ago etc etc there are endless discussions pro and con baha'u'llah sets aside these discussions by one word and statement he says quote, the divine sovereignty hath no beginning and no ending end quote. by this announcement and its demonstration he has established a standard of agreement among those who reflect upon this question of divine sovereignty brought reconciliation and peace in this war of opinion and discussion briefly there were many universal cycles preceding this one in which we are living they were consummated completed and their traces obliterated the divine and creative purpose in them was the evolution of spiritual man just as it is in this cycle the circle of existence is the same circle it returns the tree of life has ever borne the same heavenly fruit end of section fifty one recording by nicholas james bridgewater recorded in oxford england